this point, let us also look at how we look at, ask this question, are there any selection rules here for these transitions? We talked about the selection rules for RF induced transitions. Okay. RF induced transitions will say there is plus minus one. Delta F is equal to plus minus one. But and there the field was a constant field, DC field. But here both are fluctuating dipoles. Therefore, the interaction here is mu1 dot mu2 between the two dipoles. It is mu1 dot mu2. So the two spins are available. Two spins are interact. Both the spins can fit. Right? So the perturbation is the perturbation is mu1 dot mu2. And what is the value of total value of M here? Total value of M is equal to minus 1, and this total value of M is 1, and here M is equal to 0, and this also M is equal to 0. Okay. A single flip will cause a transition from here to here, or here to here, here to here, and here to here. All these are called as single quantum transitions, and these are those which are induced by your RF. RF induces only these single quantum transitions. Now, if there are both flips possible, both flips happening at the same time possible, then you can go from here to here, and also from here to here. Are these permitted or not? Now if you look at this perturbation, it certainly says okay, these are two things are possible because both flips are possible. According to this perturbation, two, flip, two spin flips are possible. And therefore, this is not prohibited. These are called double quantum transitions and this is called a single the zero quantum transition because the delta m is 0 between these two here delta m is 2 so these ones are called double quantum transitions and these ones are called zero quantum transitions and there is no ban on any of these travel ban is not there so <laughs> so you have both single quantums double quantums and zero quantums all of these are permitted when it is fluctuations in the magnetic field due to that point. Okay? So this same selection rules are not. Of course, you can extend this argument further and say, suppose I have three spins. 
I have three spins interacting. Will the triple quantum be allowed? See, three spins would mean, of course, I will also have three spins going together, three spins going down together, like this. Then the value of the difference between them is three. Okay. Is that allowed? Tell me. I mean, this is just thinking. I mean, you don't need a, you don't need a big theoretical knowledge here. You just need to think as to is that possible. You just look at what is my perturbation. Perturbation Hamiltonian has only two entities. This is a bipolar interaction. It is a bipolar interaction mu one dot mu two. So bipolar interaction can have only two spins at any time. Therefore, it is not allowed. So therefore, here it will be delta m is equal to 0, plus minus 1, plus minus 2. So the dipolar transitions are always restricted to these only. 0, plus minus 1, plus minus 2. Yeah, this one is my 1.111. Now I, I will now since all these are permitted. You, so that you want to take one minute break? Let us try and see how much is the power available at this vectors. <coughs> the power available is let me define a quantity called say zero. This is essentially all these are derived from uh, this expression and uh, this here. If I put omega equal to zero, okay? so J zero. Uh, let's let's put it as uh, zero as like omega naught. Okay, is equal to Two times tau c times that constant k, which is the ensemble average, and j1 is given by two times tau c into k divided by one plus omega squared tau c squared. So, I, of course, I can put here. Uh, Is it a constant value, omega naught equal to omega? And J2 is omega is equal to 2 omega naught. This is 2 times per C times A divided by 1 plus 4 omega naught square tau C square. So this is the power available at double quantum frequency, power available at single quantum frequency, and that is at zero quantum frequency. And they all get reduced to the same number if omega naught tau c is far far less than 1. Let's consider those conditions. Omega naught tau c is far far less than 1. J1 
and J2 will go to 0. In other words, the power available approach 0. As you increase the power, because the denominator becomes much, much larger, you can ignore and therefore it will approach 0. <coughs> and that's what is evident from this curve as well. That is evident from this curve as well. Right? So omega naught tau, if I look at this curve, when you go to two times of charge, is almost zero. And similarly this one. And, and uh, this one is present all through with such a wide range of all the way up to two times, they are all, all the same. So there is enough power available at all the frequencies and equal power available. J0 is equal to J1 is equal to J2. When omega naught tau C is much less than 1. You, what you see in this? The Mx and the My components, these decay with the characteristic time T2, transverse relaxation, right? And Mz represents the T1 relaxation. T1 relaxation is contributed by Hx and Hy. These are in the transverse plane. Hx and Hy are the components of the fluctuating field, field corroded with the fluctuations in the transverse plane. And therefore, and this happens because of the precession. The nuclei continuously precess in the presence of the magnetic field, and therefore there is always this fluctuating uh, frequency fluctuation happening here. So it is contributed by Hx and Hy. And that this causes a transition. Right? And if you look at Mx and My, the T2 is contributed both by Hx and Hz. 
It takes an at z. What did contribute? At y, at y, and at z. And at z contributes to fluctuations in the energy levels. Okay? Contributes to fluctuations in the energy levels, and therefore it contributes to the decoherence. Please, the decoherence. The frequencies will change. If the energy levels will fluctuate, frequencies will change. And what does the z do? Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, HZ contributes to energy level changes. HY and HZ, they cause transitions. Therefore, the transitions will also account for T2. Now we argue how, how does the transitions account for the T2? We said there is no energy loss in the case of T2. It is only a drop effect. So only fluctuations in the energy levels which contributes to the phase decoherence. But here there are fluctuations happening. There are transitions happening. So what is what's going on? And this is, this is simultaneous transitions up and down. <clears throat> One transition happens here, other transition happens down. The energy of the system is conserved. In the T2, even though the transitions are happening, the energy is conserved, but how does it cause T2 change? Okay? Now, you consider the spring. So you have the spin here, it goes to this point and then it comes down, then it comes down and here I will say the spin is here and it comes down. The net, there is no change in the energy of the system because for every spin that goes up, there is another spin coming down. So system it is bad. When it goes and comes down, it loses its space memory and it goes up and then it comes down, it loses its payment. Therefore, when the precision was happening, if it was at this location at a particular point and it caused the flip, when it comes back, it may not be here, it may be here. So therefore, it loses its phase memory in the process of the transition. If it loses phase memory, then it loses to phase co decoherence. You understand? So, simultaneous transitions can cause a loss of phase memory and that causes the decoherence and therefore it contributes to the T2. So the T2 can arise both because of fluctuations in the energy levels but also because of the transitions when there is a phase memory is lost. And this does happen every time. What is the guarantee that once it goes up, when it comes back down, it has the same phase? There is no guarantee. Therefore it loses its phase memory and that leads to the uh, T2 relaxation. So why does it happen in the case of the phase? The phase is not involved. It's only the population. Mm -hmm. It's only the total population. So maintain the population is maintained according to the Boltzmann distribution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Population is always maintained with, uh, as per the Boltzmann distribution. Okay, now after a very elaborate detailed calculation, you can get expressions for the T1s and the T2s. So, I'll, how these things must have come about? Okay, even without going into the actual derivations. Sir, can you please again explain how does it do the memory? No, it is not necessary that it will have to remember its memory. When it goes up and comes down, it's not necessary that it has to have the same memory. Sorry, it could have rotated. It could have rotated. It doesn't have the same memory. It doesn't go there. So the, the, what I'm saying is the phase coherence can be lost because of this. In the absence of this also it is lost. In the absence of what? Transition. Then also it is lost, yes, because of the fluctuations in the energy levels. Then also it will lose, yes. I'm saying all these factors will contribute. Both the factors will contribute to the loss of phase, phase coherence, phase coherence between the spins, between two spins. Both the factors can contribute. We have formal equations for R1, relaxation rate is equal to 1 over T1. This is equal to uh, some constant here, k0, 0, 
2 times the amount for h cross square divided by 5 times r r to the power 6 this r is the intermediate distance tau c defined differently by the power 1 plus times the C plus 5 on C divided by 1 plus omega squared plus C squared plus 2 times the C divided by 1 plus 4 omega squared plus C squared. This is the point on one line. K0 is the zero yeah, yeah, I, I, I will find that. K0 is Sometimes in books you also see there is D00. Zero zero, yeah. But it doesn't matter. K00 zero zero is given by mu0 divided by 4 pi to the power of square, where u0 is the probability. And these are formal solutions which you get when we go through a rigorous calculation. And uh, and you see here from this equation, R1 has the J1 dependence and the J2 dependence. The first term is the J1. Right, omega square tau c square. The second term is 4 times omega square tau c square, that means it is a J2. First one is J1. And this fellow has J0, J1, and J2. All the three power. Uh, 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 see, they will all contribute here. Now you can see here for. Omega naught tau c for for less than one.
So for omega naught tau c for less than 1, what do you get? R1 is equal to R2 is equal to some constant k times 2 times tau c. You can substitute there. Omega tau c is far less than 1, you can ignore the denominators, right? So you get tau c plus 4 tau c, that is 5. And then you factor 2 there, that makes it 10 tau c. And so here, 3 plus 5 plus 2. Okay. Other things remain the same. So R1, R2 are equal. For 4 less than 1. And that is That is this part of the curve. Say so if I wait to plot the T1, T2 also here. Suppose I wait to plot the T2 also here. Then it will also follow the same. Here until here. Huh? Now for omega naught tau c larger than 1, larger than 1, so R1 goes towards 0. So relaxation becomes less and less efficient. T1 goes towards infinity with very large value. And R2 becomes K some other constant, K prime times 3 times tau C. Therefore, if I were to plot here the T2 as well, how does that go? Suppose I do the same thing for T2. There is, there is no other color. So, T2 as tau C, so it will monotonously, it will decrease. T2 will monotonously decrease with increasing tau C, whereas T1 decreases and increases. And as you can see from these equations. So how R1 is 0? Because, because of this, omega naught tau C is far far less than 1, uh, far far greater than 1, therefore that whole thing is 0. Each term is 0. Assume omega naught tau c goes to infinity. Very large value. And I say far like this, very large value. Then each of the term is zero. So but why is it no increasing from this equation? Because it is k times three, it is always k times three. See here it was two times tau c increasing with R1 is increasing with two times, so the T1 is decreasing. T2 uh, is decreasing and it continues to decrease afterwards also. It doesn't have the minimum. Doesn't have R1 doesn't have the maximum or the T1 doesn't have T2. R2 doesn't have the maximum or, or the T1 the minimum. Therefore it will continuously decrease. And in the initial phases T1 and T2 are going together. They don't change. And R1 and R2 is equal to same. Okay, so one last point I will uh, make and then we will uh, we'll close this. One comment about the sensitivity. Under 
no saturation. So one can derive the obtainable signal intensity. So sensitivity is actually proportional to the square of your magnetic field, ideally, but of course there is, in practice you don't get that square factor, you get a 3 by 2 factor, because of the noise components which is not included in the calculation, which is instrumental in nature, and uh, say if I want to write in terms of the field, Sensitivity is proportional to in terms of field. It's proportional to n i plus one mu cube. That's zero square divided by minus one. How do I get mu cube here? I will leave you there. Because I've taken it out from omega naught. Okay, so it's gamma, this gamma i, gamma i, so I have here gamma square i square here, so then it is mu. So here we get gamma square is square, h not square. So I have an i square there and divided by i square here. So gamma square i square gives me mu, so mu square, therefore I have mu cube into h not square divided by I square. So you see the sensitivity is proportional to the cube of your magnetic moment and to the square of the applied magnetic field. But in reality you will not get two factors, you will get a factor of 5 by 2 because the noise is not included in this. So if we include noise, which is instrumental, the proportionality goes to the mu to the power 5 by 2, 0 power 3 by 2. This is, this is the observation and this is what you have to remember. And therefore, you see the gamma, the proton, therefore, is the obvious choice because of this, because it has the highest magnetocarrier ratio and you can go only up to a certain limit with regard to the field, how much whatever you can get. So, therefore, you always want to detect proton wherever possible. In all your carbon-13 experiments, carbon-13 sensitivity will be very low because this gamma is one-fourth of the point, but it's intrinsic relative sensitivity. Absolute sensitivity is a product of relative, this is a relative sensitivity. Relative sensitivity times the uh, actual evidence uses absolute sensitivity. And if you have, of course, enriched samples, then of course that doesn't uh, arise. So you will only have the relative sensitivity. Okay, I think we can stop here.